All right. I'd like to uh, welcome you uh, to this uh, wonderful Wednesday here. And so I hope you're having a good start to your your Wednesday. Um, just to be consistent in what I have done uh, ever since, uh, you know, the presidential election uh, in November is just kind of make make you aware of those historic moments as we get to this day. Today is the day in which uh, the 46th president of the United States is going to be sworn in. And so it is inauguration day. So it is an important day in our governmental system where we uh, either uh, carry on with an administration or move from one administration to another. And that is what is going on right now. Um, and uh, the, uh, the ceremony leading up to the swearing in of the, the new vice president and new president is going on right now. And pretty soon the vice president will be sworn in as well as the president. Um, 11 o'clock today, the president will be uh, sworn in. Uh, and so when we look at that transition, um, typically we have uh, the outgoing president there with the incoming president, as well as former vice pre uh, former presidents and vice presidents are there as well. So um, uh, in terms of former presidents, uh, we have uh, uh, former President uh, Barack Obama, former President uh, uh, George uh, W. Bush, and uh, former President uh, Bill Clinton is there. And uh, unfortunately, uh, President uh, former President Jimmy Carter is not there. Uh, health reasons. He is, um, well, I think he's like 97 or 98 years old. And so he's our oldest uh, living president. Uh, so health reasons obviously is going to prevent him from being there as well. Um, outgoing president uh, Donald Trump is not going to be there. So he is um, uh, going to be like one of four uh, presidents who do not have not attended uh, the, the inauguration. You had both of the Adams, John Adams and John Q. Adams, Andrew Johnson and uh, President Trump. President Trump had um, earlier in the day uh, uh, left the White House, uh, gave a little gave a little speech and then uh, uh, had got on Air Force One uh, to uh, to Florida. And uh, he if he wanted to go on Air Force One, he needed to do that uh, before noon, uh, since uh, he would be still the president up to noon. And so uh, after afternoon, uh, it would no longer be called Air Force One if he was on that plane. So maybe that was important to do there. All right. Um, so enough of me rambling about that. Does anyone have any thoughts or questions about uh, this day, Inauguration Day? Feel free to unmute or put into the chat any thoughts or, or questions or concerns that you may have. All right. So uh, my goal is to try to uh, get this uh, Google Meet done before uh, noon. So uh, you could have an opportunity to uh, watch uh, the president, uh, the 46th president be um, sworn in, if that's something that you're interested of, you know, if you're a political junkie, I mean, naturally you're going to be glued to it and all that. Okay. So um, with that, just want to move forward and focus on what are, what are our tasks at hand today. And uh, do want to remind you that um, yesterday was the deadline for missing work. And so if, oh, Ella, you have a question? Is the inauguration at 11 or 12? Well, the president is sworn in at uh, noon, uh, which I which I believe will be Eastern time. And so uh, that would be put it at 11 o'clock our time. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, any other questions? Again, you know, me telling time is not necessarily the greatest thing as well. I was the kid in third grade sent home with a, with a clock and, and my mom would have to uh, drill me on uh, the different uh, time of the day and all that stuff. So um, 
Any other questions related to it? Okay, so I, I wanna wrap up uh, Joseph Stalin here today, our case study of Joseph Stalin, and then um, uh, remind you that uh, we do have an assessment on uh, authoritarian states, which will actually open up today around one-ish, and then you have till 11.59 tomorrow to uh, get PM to get that assessment taken care of. Um, earlier, what I was saying is if you uh, still have some outstanding work that you uh, uh, would like to turn in, um, make sure that you reach out to me and, and let me know, and um, I can give you uh, credit for that. But please reach out, let me know. Uh, after, after yesterday, I really don't go back and look at missing work unless you uh, make me aware of it, and we can have some arrangements and stuff like that. All right. So um, to be consistent with uh, the study of Hitler, uh, there is a Google form that I would like you to fill out, uh, in this case about Joseph Stalin. And I put a link uh, to it in uh, the chat, but you can also find it uh, in school as well as an assignment where we're looking at how big of an authoritarian Joseph Stalin is. All right. To kind of kickstart this a little bit, I do have a little, just a brief video clip of um, Joseph Stalin, and it's with his passing um, and what that what that means for uh, the Soviet Union. So just bear with me. We've got a little video clip here. Uh, the only thing that might be uh, disturbing about this video clip is just seeing a dead Joseph Stalin, and so uh, viewer discretion if necessary. March 1953. The Soviet Union mourns the death of Stalin. For almost three decades, Stalin ruled supreme. How would they manage without him? It felt as if the whole world was about to collapse. We wondered what was going to happen to us. We thought of Stalin as our father, who would always look after us. Stalin died without naming a successor. A collective leadership emerged, led by Georgi Malenkov, Lavrenti Beria, Vyacheslav Molotov, and Nikita Khrushchev. Millions of Russians grieved for their dead leader, even though his rule had been ruthless and their own welfare neglected. Stalin had transformed the Soviet Union into a superpower, but at his death, relations with America and the West had seldom been worse. Okay, um, so just again, just a little brief uh, video clip there, maybe about two minutes tops there. Um, but you can see from that video clip um, just the impact that Joseph Stalin is going to have on uh, the people of the Soviet Union, the, the nation as a whole. And then it, it will have a ripple effect uh, on the geopolitical scene as well. After all, we are in the, the beginnings of uh, the Cold War when uh, he does pass away in 1953. Uh, so and, and that's a that's a big one. Um, anyone have like any thoughts or or takeaways just from that little tiny clip?
Uh, yeah. So, is yeah. there a reason why his coffin was such a bold red color? Bold red color. Um, you know, uh, I, I will have to, to say I'm, I'm not really certain why. I can only speculate. You know, if it's such a bold red color, just maybe um, just uh, to go along with uh, communism and the idea of red with communism and they were the reds. So, um, and it's red square, but I really haven't know the, the importance of the symbolism of it. So I guess I can't really talk too much about that one. And if anyone knows, feel free to unmute and share. Um, I do know that briefly he was um, uh, put on public viewing like, uh, like Lenin, but then eventually he is put uh, into the mausoleum in, in Red Square. Uh, anyone else have any thoughts? Uh, was there a reason why he didn't name a successor, or was that just an untimely death? You know, uh, it was, uh, the death was, uh, seemed to be sudden, and uh, that could also speak to uh, his, um, you know, perhaps paranoia, if we look at, um, and, and sharing of potentially power, and so, uh this is going to be common uh, when a leader like Stalin passes away. Uh, you are going to have a power struggle. So it could be a number of combination to recap, just a number of combinations on why a successor isn't, isn't named. Uh, Joseph Stalin did not anticipate his mortality uh, was coming on. Um, and again, it's just power maintaining the power and not willing to, uh, to share that power. Uh, you're going to see, you're going to see power struggles, uh, when, uh, Brezhnev passes away, uh, when, uh, Khrushchev, excuse me, before Brezhnev, Khrushchev is demoted. Uh, when Brezhnev passes away, uh, there'll be a power struggle. Um, when Mao passes away, there'll be a power struggle. So it's, it's fairly common. Uh, it seems like uh, in in a communist country, uh, and sometimes even if a, a person is known, there still is going to be a power struggle. Like at the end of uh, that clip, there there was a power struggle between four. Uh, Nikita Khrushchev is going to eventually emerge uh, from that struggle, and it's going to take a few years to do. All right, anyone else have any questions? I have a comment. Yes. Um, I just thought it was interesting that the funeral or whatever type of thing that he had um, was so public because I feel like um, in America, like any like super important individual mm -hmm. doesn't normally have a public viewing or anything. Mm -hmm. Like they try to keep it like pretty private and like, pretty like protected. So I just thought it was interesting. Right. I think I think I think that that that's a good observation. Um, I would say though, when we do have high profile uh, leaders, even in the United States, sometimes you do see them what we call lay and rest in uh, the Capitol rotunda, and in which people can can view them. Like uh, what what comes to my mind is the passing of uh, Senator John McCain where uh, he was laid to rest, as well as John Lewis, excuse me, was laid to rest briefly in our nation's uh, capital um, building, the Rotundra, in which people could view. Uh, and so uh, for Joseph Stalin, one would say that probably was uh, planned uh, to be that big uh, since uh, there was such a tremendous cult of personality and his importance that he had on the Soviet Union and to, to stage it and to get it right uh, and to make sure that you are visible there to be seen by Stalin. Important. Each of those people that were being mentioned in the power struggle is there as um, uh, Paul Bearers uh, to uh, uh, carry Stalin. Um, and so uh, very public, very public. Uh, Lenin's passing was was very very public as well 
Uh, Brezhnev's passing is going to be very public. So in the Soviet Union sense, yes. Um, you know, and, and, and for us, for our presidents, when they pass, uh, there usually are um, public ceremonies as well. I appreciate the observation. Uh, anyone else have any comments? All right, so what I want to do here is, you know, as, I, as I'm talking a little bit about Stalin's era, feel free to fill out that, that Google form as um, I go through this. And afterwards, I'll give some time uh, for you uh, to fill out that Google form, and then I'll talk a little bit about it as well. Uh, so from uh, Joseph Stalin here, his era, um, we're looking at his era as really from about 1924 to 1953. And you could say after Lenin's death, that little power struggle that had occurred for about three years is about 1924 to 1927. 1927, you could uh, make a claim that uh, uh, he is now uh, the leader of the uh, Soviet Union. And so what does that really mean and what does it really, really look like here? Um, and it definitely, he changes the character of the, uh, the Soviet state. Um, Stalinism, that's something, you know, that historians like to explain or describe, um, the type of communism that, uh, was under Joseph Stalin. Uh, Stalin likes to perhaps call it Marxist Leninism. Uh, he doesn't necessarily refer to it as Stalinism by any means, but clearly it, he changed the Soviet nation. Um, it is a definitely a part state um, dominated by the bureaucracy, uh, full command economy, suppression of democracy, a culture of conformity. Uh, this is the type of communism that Stalin is creating here. Uh, when we look at Soviet communism, it is violent, and in many ways, um, this is just an element that Lenin would say is a part of revolutionary movement. And so um, we shouldn't be surprised uh, then that uh, the purges that occurred under Stalin, um, we sh again, we shouldn't be surprised because it's an element of revolutionary uh, movement here. Uh, it definitely was a revolution from above, and that basically meant Stalin was uh, the architect of it. Uh, he maintained uh, this um, idea that uh, the nation, the, the character of it is going to uh, exude from him. He was the great motivator, so he was the essential shaper of uh, the Soviet Union. So revolution from above, where sometimes we typically look at revolution from, from the masses, um, it's really coming from him. There is this party loyalty, and it's something that they refer to as the uh, nomenclatura, uh, which is um, basically uh, party loyal. Uh, he had found throughout the years a number of subordinates. So where the communist party in a sense becomes his party, any of the old revolutionary Bolsheviks are going to be removed and replaced by these new upcoming uh, communists, this new generation. So this uh, nomenclature uh, is going to replace the revolutionary Bolsheviks and they're just going to follow they're going to follow Stalin uh, blindly uh, in whatever he does. And, and there's this fear of Stalin as well amongst uh, party members, as well as among uh, the people of the Soviet Union. Um, not everyone, again, belonged to the Communist Party, but they definitely were affected by the Communist Party. So you have this fear of Stalin. You just naturally follow whatever he, he does. Uh, this blind allegiance there. And then you have uh, this, this idea of lack of tradition of civil rights. And um, we shouldn't be totally shocked or surprised that in the Soviet Union there is a lot, lack of civil rights. After the communists were just continuing the tradition 
uh, that uh, had existed under Tsarist Russia. And so uh, what you see happening in the Soviet Union is the same thing that was going to be is going to be happening under uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, the lack of uh, civil rights uh, tradition is just being maintained in, in these particular countries. So definitely when we look at uh, the Soviet state, Joseph Stalin is going to um, change it. So does he really create an authoritarian state? You know, how does he stack up with um, Adolf Hitler? And so that's where you have our, that Google form that, again, I would like for you to uh, fill out. And again, you can find that link in the chat or you can find it in Schoology here. And um, here is the form. So let's take about 10 minutes here and let's uh, answer this, uh, this question, this Google form, excuse me, where again, you're looking at ways in which he had established the totalitarian state three at least three areas where you got to give him thumbs up on uh and explain why and give a couple thumbs down on where he may not have done so well and and then also overall kind of give a little rating on a one to ten here one being not so well ten being outstanding now remember we, as a group, we kind of gave uh, Adolf Hitler a uh, 7.8 on the scale. So about an 8% or 8, 8 out of 10. So think about did Joseph Stalin do uh, as good as Hitler or just a little worse or a little better? All right, let's take a moment here, answer. Let's get at it. Remember, use your foreign po domestic and foreign policy uh, activity for um, guidance. Think about those video clips that we had watched. Think about what you know. So realistically, three things go into the grade book this week the domestic and foreign policy activity, your responses to this Google form, and then the uh, unit two assessment on um, or, excuse me, unit three assessment here on um, oh, I'm sorry, unit two assessment on authoritarians. Does anyone have any questions on the Google form?
Ella, do you have a question? No. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Okay, as you're, you're as you're finishing working on this, um, just a few comments about you know, when we talk about authoritarian states. I mean, all these individuals uh, kind of fit the definition of an authoritarian. And sometimes, you know, we want to look at our, to what degree are they a totalitarian? So, kind of emerge away from being an authoritarian, that of totalitarian, just is to the degree of total control um, that a person is, all right? And so sometimes, you know, we try to interchange authoritarian and totalitarian, um, but they really are um, different, different words. And so sometimes it is kind of amazing to think that, you know, historians are going to discuss and debate whether or not uh, Stalin is a strong authoritarian. And uh, or is he an totalitarian? Whenever you are a leader in general, uh, when you make a you come to a decision and then you pass that decision on to someone else, then uh, that in some ways is going to impact uh, to what degree of an authoritarian or degree of a totalitarian you are, or um, a strong or a weak um, leader depending on how that uh, subordinate or that next person carries out your, your wishes and your, your goals. So um, for, for Stalin, uh, the idea of when he is signing these orders um, and then he's going to be passing it off to uh, an, a minister who then may pass it off to a, a regional boss or to a local uh, party leader, they got to get carried through. And um, sometimes, you know, things get massaged. Uh, the numbers get massaged uh, in order to show the effectiveness or maybe not effectiveness. Okay. So as I see more and more coming in here, I'm just going to do a little, um, little debriefing here of this in that uh, when we look at areas in which he, he does seem to be doing extremely well, all right, um, the, power, the power is exercised by the party leader, absolutely. I mean, he is the head, and he has his pulse on this party at various levels, and then within the government as well. So this is something that's going to distinguish him from perhaps um, Hitler and um, Mao as well as, you know, other people like Fidel Castro and Benito Mussolini and that stuff is 
amount of power he has on his party. All right, the state use of censorship and propaganda absolutely is going to do well there. Um, internal opponents are identified and uh, stamped out absolutely. All right, um, they're purged, they're exiled, showcase trials imprisoned, all that stuff comes into play here as well. Um, so those definitely are um, some really, really good areas uh, that control, exerting the power, definitely. But when it comes to like where he struggles, all right, religion, remember, um, in a, in, in a communist world, religion is um, is really uh, outlawed, um, it, or it's they're an atheistic country, and so uh, cannot have a rival um, philosophy by any means, and so uh, he he will struggle as well as Lenin will struggle uh, with the controlling of uh, the religious aspects. All right. And so, and even during the war though, he, he then brings it back and he's going to use it. So he might not get necessary total, total, get rid of it, total control. If you can't get rid of it, maybe try to find a way to influence it. All right. Um, and the status of women, the status of women, uh, it goes back and forth. Under Lenin, you see women progressing. Uh, in uh, Stalin's Soviet Union, there is a regression with the Great Retreat. All right, I'm going to uh, interrupt here for a moment. Uh, looks like uh, we do have a, a uh, president has been uh, has been. Uh, sworn in so we do officially have a 46th president which is uh president now joseph biden so okay brief interrupt uh, interruption there so um i do encourage you to our political junkie go back take a look at um the swearing ceremony and all that stuff all right back to this so um you can see though we were kind of across the board and trying to figure out where he has his shortcomings. We can definitely uh, find where he's got his strengths, but I do think it's kind of interesting as we get down here where we're falling on the spectrum. Uh, you know, um, we, we got one that thinks he's, he's perfect. We've got at least five and nine, uh, five and eight, uh, to a seven, you know, I'm not again a numbers person, but I think, I think he, he will probably come in a little higher than, uh, Adolf Hitler as a totalitarian. All right. I, I know some of you probably have your calculator by you and you could probably add up those numbers as well to figure that piece out. Um, but, uh, he definitely is in that, is in that, in that realm. Uh, does anyone have like any comments or any fallback or uh, observations you want want to say about Joseph Stalin here? Now, in the um, pre-pandemic era of this course, uh, typically what we would have done is after studying Hitler, Stalin, and Mao. And those of those who have me 3.1 will be studying Mao. Um, and then whether it's 3.1 and 3 part two, there'll be a case study on another individual. Um, we'd have almost a little competition in the authoritarians to see who actually is the top authoritarian. We bring some other authoritarians into the fold. And um, it's very interesting to, to see how Stalin and Hitler kind of match up with some of these other authoritarians that we are focusing on. All right. If you are not done with uh, the Google form, please, let's get that in. 
Um, I like to give you credit for it. So let's uh, submit this uh, Google form. Note that uh, later today or tomorrow, you have an opportunity to take the uh, authoritarian states assessment. And the formatting is very similar to that of uh, the previous one, where it's short answer and you're going to have a pool of uh, questions, uh, prompts. And so I do encourage you to really uh, look at that review sheet, use it. Um, use it as a guide to help you uh, answer uh, those questions. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any follow up or any questions related to uh, Joseph Stalin or anything about the assessment? All right. Um, tomorrow we will not have a live Google Meet. I'm going to give you time to, to complete uh, the uh, the assessment, you know, I will have one open just in case you want to pop on and ask me some questions then. Uh, uh, feel free to stay on the Google Meet right now if you have questions, but if not, you are free to go. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Newcomb? Yes. I'm planning to submit one of my, um, the assessment that was due yesterday. Yep. Today, after the um, inauguration. Yes, that would be fine. Um, please, uh, please submit it. Okay. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Hi, Mr. Nook. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you uh, because uh, distance learning uh, for students like me with ADHD has been really difficult. And just yeah. the layout of your class and the way you did everything, it made it a heck of a lot easier. And I just want to say thank you for that. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that comment. Um, I always wonder, you know, if... Um, what I'm doing is is effective. It, it's working, and so uh, I appreciate appreciate that comment. 